All right, welcome to what could very well be the last stats video of 2020. Um, unless there's like stats videos in the fall of 2020 because we're still teaching from home. But fingers crossed, here's hope that doesn't happen. All right, so let's take a look at this and we'll see what's going on. This is going to kind of give you one last look at the three different types of problems um, all on the same sheet, so you know how to kind of pick out which one you're supposed to do um, for a given situation. All right, so first things first. It says the National Gun Policy Survey asked a random sample of adults. Do you think there should be a law that would ban possession of handguns except for police and other authorized persons? Here are the responses broken down by respondents' level of education. All right, so we've got Different things there, less than high school, high school graduate, some college, college graduate, postgraduate, and then yes or no. And then it says, determine whether or not the sample provides convincing evidence that education level and opinion about a handgun ban are dependent in the adult population. All right, so first things first, um, we have a table here. So because there's a table of data... Um, let me say that another way, because it can be a table regardless. Um, because we have two variables. We have the education level and we have their opinion, yes or no. Um, it's a two-way table, so this is going to be a situation where we either use homogeneity or independence. The chi-score test of homogeneity or independence. The question is, which one do we use? Remember, homogeneous is for when you, the researcher, are creating groups, um, and then you ask basically a single question, and you see, does the response change over the different groups? Independence is when you have just sort of a single group, but you're asking about two different things, all right? So again, the difference is with the independence, you know, you're not creating um, the groups, they just form naturally based on responses to questions, where in the homogeneous situation, you are the one actually creating the groups. So if we look at this one here, it says we asked a random sample of adults, All right? And we just have a single sample here, all right? We didn't go out and specifically look for people of different education levels, we collected a single sample, we asked about their education level, we asked about their opinion, but we didn't create the groups. So since we didn't create the groups, this is going to be a chi-squared test of independence. And really, the test for independence and the test for homogeneity work exactly the same way. The only difference is how you write your null and your alternative. So when it's a test of independence, our null is going to be there is no relationship. between education level and opinion on handguns. And then the alternative is that same exact sentence, except we drop the no. So it becomes, there is a relationship between education level and opinion on handguns. All right. So again, if we're looking at this, no relationship, this would be the situation where we're saying the two things are independent. There is a relationship is where we're saying the two things are dependent. All right, so that's kind of the significance of both of those. We still pick an alpha level 
the way that we always do. All right. Now, to do one of these on your calculator, all right, we have to go to the matrix menu. All right, so that's second x to the negative one is where the matrix button is. All right, you're gonna scroll over to edit and we're gonna edit matrix A. The first number is the number of rows, the second number is the number of columns, and then you'll notice I actually already typed all this information in just to save us a little time. So 58, 58, 84, 129, so on and so forth. All right, so all of those numbers are in there. All right, we then go to stat tests, and we go to the chi-squared test, not the GOF, that's a different test. We're using chi-squared test for this one. We can hit enter. Observed is A. Expected, again, expected isn't anything we type in. All right, that's just where the expected values are gonna be placed. So we hit calculate. All right, it gives us our chi-squared statistic of 8.53. So our chi-squared statistic is 8.53, our p-value was, let's see, 0 0.0741. All right, and then it does tell us that there are four degrees of freedom, because remember the chi-square distribution changes shape based on the degrees of freedom. And again, that four comes from the number of rows, minus one, times the number of columns minus one. So five minus one times two minus one is where that four is coming from. Now, as far as interpreting the p-value, that's exactly the same as the other ones. So on this one, it's above 5%. So we fail to reject the null, which in this case means there's not enough evidence to say these things are dependent. So there's one type of problem. All right, let's look at problem number two. Inquiring minds want to know, do seagulls show a preference for where they land? Jeez, I want to know that. Um, to answer this question, biologists conducted a study in an enclosed outdoor space. Think about the movie Biodome. If you haven't seen Biodome, highly recommend Biodome. Um, not sure I actually recommend Biodome, but you know what I'm saying. Um, with a piece of shore whose area was made up of 56% sand, 29% mud, and 15% rocks, the biologist chose 200 seagulls at random. Each seagull was released into the outdoor space on its own and observed until it landed somewhere on the piece of shore. In all, 128 seagulls landed on sand, 61 landed in the mud, and 11 landed on the rocks. Carry out a chi-squared goodness of fit test. What do you conclude? All right, so this one is specifically telling us we're doing the goodness of fit test. Um, if it hadn't told us that, the way we could tell is that there's only one variable here, all right? The only variable is where are they landing, all right? Um, there's no second variable that we're measuring here. Now, to do a chi-squared goodness of fit test, you need the actual values, and we have those right here, 128. 61, and 11, and we also need the expected values. All right, so to get the expected values, we're gonna use those percentages that they gave us in the problem. So it tells us there were 200 seagulls in total. If it was 56% sand, 29% mud, and 15% rocks, if seagulls don't have a preference, then you would expect 56% of the seagulls to end up on sand, 29% on mud, 15% on rocks, because that's just the distribution of area. All right, so we would do for sand, 
it would just be the 0.56 times the 200, which is going to give us 112. For the mud, it would be the 0.29 times the 200, which is going to give us 58. And then for the sand, it would be the 0.15 times 200, which is going to give us the 30. All right, so we're going to need those expected values. Now, as far as writing our null and alternatives, all right, again, these are going to look a little different. Each one looks a little different. So again, this is chi squared. GOF for goodness of fit. And our null is, and the null is pretty much always the same for these. It's that the assumed proportions are correct, which is referring to the 56% sand, 29% mud, 15% rock. And the alternative is that the assumed proportions are not correct. All right, we're still doing an alpha of 0.05. And then when we're doing one of these, we don't use the matrix. We go back to stat edit. So stat edit. All right, L1 should be your ex actual values. So that's the 128, the 61, and the 11 that the problem gave us. L2 is your expected values. So that's what we calculated over there on the left, the 112, the 58, and the 30. All right. Once those are all in there, you can go to stat, tests. This time we're going to the chi-squared goodness of fit test. We tell it that the observed is an L1. We tell it that the expected is an L2. Now, degrees of freedom, this one we have to fill it in, all right? The other one, it did it for us automatically. This one we have to fill in. It's always one less than the number of categories. So we have three categories, all right? So our degrees of freedom would be three minus one or two, all right? This is referring to the number of categories. So we have three categories, sand, mud, and sand. Sand, mud, and sand. That should be sand, mud, and rock. All right. Um, and then one less than that is two. So that's what we have to put in our degrees of freedom. But you have to make sure you change that. Otherwise, you'll get the wrong answer. So I can now hit calculate. All right. It will tell me that my chi-squared statistic is 14... Point four seven. All right, chi squared statistic is fourteen point four seven. It will tell me that my p value. Be careful here. There's an e to the negative fourth there, so that's really point zero 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 seven one nine. And then underneath there, it gives you the different components of your chi-squared statistic. Because remember, when you calculate a chi-squared statistic, you're doing it for each individual one. You're doing like the actual uh, minus the expected squared divided by the expected. So it's telling us for sand, the component was 2.2. For mud, the component was 0.15. And then for rock, the component was 12. So we ended up with this really tiny p-value. And we can see that most of this statistic actually came from rock because that was the one that was deviating furthest from what was expected. We expected 30. We only got 11. So when we write our conclusion here, you know, we reject the null and accept the alternative, 
what's driving that conclusion, what's driving this realization that the assumed proportions are not correct, is the large deviation that we saw with the rock value. All right, this is the one that's really driving our result because it makes up most of this value right here. Again, remember, this value is just the sum of these three different components. And we can see that most of this is made up from the rock component, which is why we end up rejecting the null hypothesis here. All right, so let's flip it over to the back. All right, Kellogg's Fruit Loop cereal comes in six fruit flavors. I use the term fruit lightly. Orange, lemon, cherry, raspberry, blueberry, and lime. Yesterday morning, I poured my morning bowl of cereal and counted the number of cereal pieces of each flavor. I'm just that cool. Here's my data. Um, test the null hypothesis that the population of Fruit Loops produced by Kellogg's contains an equal proportion of each flavor. Um, if you find a significant result, identify which components seem to be driving your conclusion. All right. So this is another goodness of fit. All right. The reason I can tell that is there's only a single variable that I'm looking at here is the flavor of um, Fruit Loops. Now this one's a little different. It doesn't give me a percentage, but it does say that each one should have an equal amount. So what we can do is we can add these together and say, all right, that's 49, 59, 65, 85, 90, 104, 120. All right, so in total, there were 120. We have one, two, three, four, five, six flavors. So 120 divided by six would be 20 of each. So here are actual values. Our expected values would just be for each of these 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, and 20. And again, that's coming from just this little calculation over here. All right. Otherwise, once we have those two pieces, it's exactly like we did before. So this is chi squared GOF. Our null would be the assumed proportions are correct. Our alternative would be the assumed proportions are not correct. Our alpha is going to be 0.05. Remember on these we have to calculate the degrees of freedom ourselves. All right, there are six categories. All right, for the six different flavors, we're going to subtract one from that. So our degrees of freedom for this problem are going to be 5. All right. Now we bring it over to our calculator. We go to stat edit L1 is going to be our actual values, so 28, 21, 16, 25, 14, and 16. Our expected, since they said an equal distribution of flavors, is just 20 for each of them. 20, 20, 20, 20, and 20. All right. Once all of that's in there, we go to stat calc, tests, um, so stat calc tests, not stat calc, stat, stat tests. Um, and we pick the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Observed is L1, expected is L2. Don't forget we have to manually change this, so we now have five degrees of freedom. If we hit calculate, it'll tell us that our chi-squared statistic is 7.9. It will tell us our p-value is 0.16 All right. and again it shows us the individual components so 3.2, 0.05, 0.8, 0.125, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.22, 0.23, 0.24, 0.25, 0.26, 0.27, 0.28, 0.29, 0.30, 0.31, 0.32, 0.33
which is another way of saying there's not enough evidence to say the assumed proportions are wrong. All right, so we don't even have to say there is no component driving our conclusion. Like, we didn't find a significant result on this one. On the front, there was a significant result. We rejected the null, and rock was driving our conclusion. All right, so that's kind of the difference there. Um, so again, those are just two different ways you can see the goodness of fit question. And then last but not least, number four, how is the hatching of water python eggs influenced by the temperature of a snake's nest? Researchers randomly assign newly laid eggs to one of three water temperatures, hot, neutral, or cold. Hot duplicates the extra warmth provided by the mother python. Cold duplicates the absence of the, uh, the mother. Um, here's the data on the number of eggs and the number that hatched. Are the differences between the three groups statistically significant? Give an appropriate give appropriate evidence to support your claim. All right, so notice on this one that there are three water temperatures and we set those up. It's not like we just put the eggs in water and measured the water temperature. We created those. So we created multiple samples here, one for each water temperature. And because of that, this is going to be the chi-squared test of homogeneity. So again, you just have to be able to differentiate between those two because based on which one you're picking, um, you do have to write the null hypothesis a little different. All right, so this is chi-squared test of homogeneity. All right, the null for one of these is um, the, let's say, the distribution of egg hatching. Whatever you're measuring is what comes first when you write this. Is the same across all water temps. All right, what you designed or the groups you made come second when you're writing these. And then the alternative is the same thing. It's just you're saying it's not the same. So null is it's the same. Alternative is that it's not the same. So the distribution of egg hatching is not. the same across all water temps. All right. Once you've got that, you're going to go to your matrix. All right, so x to the negative 1, we're going to edit our matrix. This one has three rows and two columns. We're going to type in the data. So 16, 11, 38, 18, 75, and 29. All right, once that's in there, we can go to stat tests, chi-squared test, observed A, expected B, calculate. All right, degrees of freedom equal two. And again, that's coming from the three rows minus one times the two columns minus one. That's where that's coming from. On this problem, our chi-squared statistic worked out to be 1.70. And our p-value worked out to be 0.4267. Okay. I forgot to write our alpha over here. Our alpha was 0.05, just like it always is. So because this is greater than our alpha, we fail to reject the null, all right? Which suggests that 
we don't have enough evidence to say that this actually makes a difference when it comes to whether or not the eggs hatch. Maybe it does, but we don't have enough evidence to say that it does one way or another. All right, so these are the different types of problems. All right, goodness of fit, chi-squared test of homogeneity. This is another way you could see goodness of fit where you have to do expected values using percentages. Um, and chi-squared test of independence. As long as you know how to do these, as long as you know how to use the calculator, write the conclusions, write the null and alternative, you should be totally fine on the, the quiz that I'm going to give you on this. All right, so I hope this was helpful. Best of luck, um, and have a great rest of your day whenever you watch this. All right, bye.